Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews Signature Series. From musicians to painters, from novelists to filmmakers, we're bringing you a diverse range of voices and perspectives, all united by their passion for their craft. And whether you're a longtime fan or a newcomer to their work, we're confident that you'll find something to inspire and captivate you in each and every one of our interviews. So join us as we journey across borders and cultures, discovering new and exciting talent and celebrating the power of art and entertainment, which brings people together. Now, in the dynamic world of the music industry, where talent meets opportunity, there are few individuals who impact and influence can be described as truly transformative. Harvey Lisberg is a prominent music manager and visionary who stands as one such figure whose contributions have left an indelible mark on the industry. With his keen business acumen, unwavering dedication, and an uncanny ability to spot talent, Harvey has played a pivotal role in shaping the career of numerous renowned artists. Born with a passion for music, Harvey's journey into the music industry began with a serendipitous encounter. Recognizing his exceptional ability as a manager, he embraced the opportunity to guide and nurture emerging talents. From the early stages of his career, Harvey displayed an innate understanding of the industry's intricate workings, positioning himself as an invaluable asset to his clients. Now, one of Lisberg's most notable accomplishments was his pivotal role in managing the iconic British rock band Herman's Hermits. Under his astute guidance, the band achieved unprecedented success, dominating the charts on both sides of the Atlantic with a string of timeless hits. We heard one earlier in this episode. Lisberg's visionary approach and meticulous attention to detail allowed the band to flourish and secure their place in music history. However, Harvey's impact extended beyond the success of Herman's Hermit. His ability to identify and nurture talent led him to work with a diverse roster of artists. Each artist under Harvey's management experienced a career transformation benefiting from his expertise in artist development, strategic planning, and industry networking. Now, as we delve deeper into the life and achievements of Mr. Lisberg's, it became evident that his unwavering commitment, industry knowledge, and ability to nurture talent made him a trailblazer within the music industry. That is why we are so honored to have Harvey Lisberg on the show to talk about his career and his newest book, I'm Into Something Good, My Life Managing 10CC, Herman Hermits, and many more. Let's get to the interview. Harvey, welcome to the show. Oh, hi. Nice being here with you, Chris. Looking forward to your questions. So, Harvey, I want to start with this. You have had an extensive career in the music industry, but now you've turned to writing a new book, which is called I'm Into Something Good, uh, My Life Managing 10CC, Herman Hermits, and many more. So I got to start off the question. Why now? Why write the book now? Well, well I'm getting on in age, obviously. Uh, <laughs> being an octogenarian and the rest. Um, and um, throughout my life, people say, why don't you write down these stories? Because uh, part of my personality is being a raconteur, a boring humor to get, make people laugh, which was one of my talents uh, originally. And I said, no, I'm never gonna write a book. No, I can't be bothered. And finally, there were people that I represented said, you really got to consider putting this down because if, if, if you don't tell these stories, nobody's ever going to know. So um, COVID arrived and stuck here. Well, not a nice week stuck here. I'm not complaining. Beautiful home, California, very nice. Um, but I thought, right, well, now's the time. So uh, Charlie Thomas, who wrote the book um, with me, he did um, a television program on I'm Not In Love, a documentary one hour that was out on the BBC. And I thought, well, he'd be great to 
use because he'd already interviewed all of Tens. So he knew the background and, and it sort of will save a lot of time. He came here for five days, recorded me, and then went back, wrote the book, and uh, that's why we did it. That's why I did it. Without COVID, I don't think I'd have, I would have ever done a book. <clears throat> what was so the process strange. like? What was the process like for yourself writing this book? Because you bring up a lot of memories and I can imagine wanting to tell the stories that you've told in this book, but also trying to make sure that you're balancing the privacy of managing uh, bands and their their privacies with what you saw and heard was probably a little bit uh, of a balancing act for you. Absolutely. But I've done it all my life. <laughs> it's not nothing new. I mean, it's a function of a manager. You know what I mean? You, you've got to know where to be, what to say. You've got to be political. And I, I, we did a lot with Charlie. I mean, five days recording, and then they transposed it and, and wrote it. But it, it, it's a tricky one. The, the, really, the editing was the time when I removed things that I didn't like. And I've done the same because I did a video of my wife's 50th birthday, Carol, and uh, I was interviewing friends and they came up with the most atrocious comments, which I, which I really, well, they weren't atrocious, they were so boring. Oh, it's all right for you. You live in Palm Springs in the sunshine. Cut. So in the end, they have about four seconds. Hello, happy birthday, good night. Oh, you know, so I was good at editing. So was it was it challenging for that the editing part of this book because I, I no, read... no Charlie was very sympathetic. We we are very similar with humor. I mean, we love humor. We're very similar. You from the book, you can tell it. I mean, yeah. And he did the additional thing. He had a different aspect on things. He was at Neb with himself, <laughs> so he thought he was there as a fan. So it was very nice for somebody that could. I could say what was going on backstage, whereas he could describe what it was like going through the countryside and all the and all the drunkenness and everything that was going on and the drugs or whatever, you know, and he was actually in there. It was lovely. We're just a great team, actually. We, we love each other, you know. So I want to talk about your career a little bit, if that's okay with you here for a second, Harvey. And I want to start with this. In your opinion, you were you were managing bands at the height of the British British invasion, but also uh, an extensive career over many decades. What set the bands you manage apart from other bands? Do you believe? I think that Herman's Hermits was my first band, so I started with them, and that was that was really nice. And maybe it was luck time and whatever, but it, it worked out very well for me. Um, once that had happened, I joined forces with uh, uh, an agent called Danny Batesh from Kennedy Street Enterprises, and I bought half the company, bought his partners out. And um, then my aim was to spread my wings. He had a lot of acts. He was the agent for Wayne Fontana, Freddie and the Dreamers. And we had one, two, and three in Billboard in 1965 which were somebody in, in from Salford or was quite an achievement really because we'd spread our wings and our aim was always to be around Manchester. Manchester was always our goal. We were not going to go to London to record. We were not going to go to New York to live because all the opportunities are. I was going to stay in Manchester and go from there. As much as uh, Epstein had to a degree from Liverpool until he moved to London. But still, that was the aim. And I think... Um, in answer to your question, which I've kind of avoided, um, then I decided, right, I wanted an act like, uh, I want songwriters, I love songs. I was always into songs, I was writing songs myself. And I knew Graham Goulman, so I got involved with him. Godly and Cream, we handled. Uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice came to us. I mean, all these songwriters, so that was one area. Singing, I wanted a Tom Jones type board, so I got Tony Christie, that was that. I wanted a band, 10CC evolved as a magnificent band, and when they did, um, I wanted a band that wasn't just a studio band, but one that would sell stadiums. And I got involved with Barclay James Harvest, who all had a tremendous following. So it was really me planning who I was going to go for and then developing them. So it wasn't so much, it, it wasn't they were like in any ways, really. In fact, every act was kind of different in a sort of way. And my real aim for the company was to be a massive conglomerate which handled classical music, 
which was totally impossible because it was locked up by a fellow called Gabay in England, total monopoly. I wanted to be in charge of comedy because I'd had dealings with Benny Hill and other people indirectly and directly. That's completely locked up by London management and a fellow called Michael Hughes in Liverpool. You couldn't get your nose in there. I wanted to be in football. Manchester United wouldn't speak to me when I had the under-21 footballer who wanted to move to them. So it was like... At the end of the day, we, we did what we had to do. We developed music. I think the main talent I had was music. I love music and had a good ear for a hit and things like that. You've seen the music industry change and adapt over the last probably few decades, probably since when you were a manager starting out in the 60s to now. What has been the biggest change, in your opinion, from the management side for musicians today, would you say? Um, well, it's, it's gone through several phases. Um, music went through management phase where the manager was the key person, then the record producer was the key person. Originally, the, the record company was ripping everybody off on ridiculous deals, much as the football clubs were ripping off the footballers at ridiculous deals. And so that after the, so we went record producers, songwriters became important, then groups that wrote their own music, and then we got punk which revolutionized against all the indulgence of myself and my associates. Uh, <laughs> Godly and Cream triple album consequences at the money. Yeah, well, I don't think the punk revolution appreciated that sort of thing. And then after punk, there was a techno electronic music came in. And it's all moving around until now we've got this awful thing, <laughs> which is, you know, what do you do? I mean, you, you, you've got to have sell merchandise and you've got to, it goes from A to Z. It's not just doing a great song. The sixties, everything was beautiful songs, hit after hit from different acts. Writers writing for different artists, not just to be doing their own stuff for whatever reason. So, and um, today it's, a, it's an industry and the record, co and you know, record companies are not really very brave. If somebody has got 20 million streams, they might risk putting something out. You know, they're not exactly, in the business of trying to help create or look for things. All they want is ready-made success so they can cash in on it. And then we're going now to the new revolution, which is TikTok and everything else from there, and gaming. And I mean, it goes on and on and on. And that's what happens. I mean, but in my day, yeah, it was the song. I'm into something that was a killer song. Do you think, and, and, and I apologize to ask this uh, uh, sort of abrupt question. I didn't plan for it, but it's just something you just said there. Do you think like, do you think bands like 10CC and Herman Herberts would have made it big to, in today's music sort of world that we currently live in? Because I always imagine if, if bands like 10CC or Herman Herberts or even the Beatles or Elvis Presley were doing what they did then today, it would be drowned out with the sort of, uh, abundance of talent that we seem to call talent. Well, abso absolutely. I mean, you don't get a film like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. You'll get Avatar 14, you know, <laughs> and I'm not going to see Avatar 14. I don't give a shit whether in underwater or overwater. Or, uh, I don't need the gimmick and the stupid situation that we're landed with. I like a great film and yeah. I can't find one. Same with music. So is it hard for you because someone who's heard such great music and has interacted with some of the biggest names in the music industry to sort of look at today's artists and go, this is, why is this considered music? Because I wouldn't look at them as a manager back in the sixties, if they came to me with some of the stuff that's being put out today. Well, I think today, as I say, it's not just the song. It's a it's a package. It's a different it's a different ball game. Peter Noon Herman could always be packaged. I'm sure Elvis Presley could always be packaged because of image. Or Freddie Mercury would always happen because he happened to be the greatest showman. But you know, I, I think generally speaking, I think it's very very difficult for a manager to find an act. Even I mean, I, I get so many wonderful tapes sent of artists that got better voices than anybody in the charts, but. That doesn't matter. They ain't going to get the sniff unless they've got 20 million streams. Maybe they need to bear their bottom or something. I don't know what they've got to do to get seen. What should artists be looking for then? For someone who's been in the industry, who's managed some of the biggest names out there, 
what should our and I and, and I know we should be talking about your book, but I find this conversation so fascinating because it ties so closely into the book. Because in the book, you mention what you saw in uh, Herman Hermits and Ten CCs. It's just and even Tim Rice and uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber. I can imagine there's people coming to you say, "What would you tell me to do if I was being if I was under your management?" Do you want me to give you a funny answer? A funny answer, sincere answer, angry answer, whatever type of answer you want to Don't give, give me. Don't give up Aaron. your day job. <laughs> oh. No, you've got to be, you've just got to have a terrible, terribly thick exterior. You've got to be able to take rejection so the cows come home. You've got to realize that you're right and everybody else is wrong. And then you have to take solace in people like Ed Sheeran who are busking and are the biggest stars in the world. So it can be done. I think it's much more difficult, and the odds are much greater, but it can be done. And talent, hopefully, will get through somehow or other, but there, it's more difficult, that's all. What about managers? What advice would you give managers who, because you talk about the monopoly of the industry back when oh. you were starting. The, there is a massive monopoly today of managers out there, and it seems like there's five managers for about 3,000 artists, what advice would you give to that prospective young Harvey who would want to try and get into the management of musicians today? Besides, don't quit your day job. <laughs> no, it's, it's not just, um, I think you've got to be prepared to, you've got to see something that you really believe in and it's got to be extraordinary. It's no good going with mediocrity. I mean, and I know that's a silly thing to say, but you know, you really need something extraordinary to, to want to start, in my opinion. Then you've just got to have rejection around both your ears and you've got to think that every single person you're playing this to is an idiot and you're a genius. And that's all you can do. You've got to have this. I'm thinking what it is, it's um, a positive approach, you know, however illogical. When I had Herman's Hermits, everybody around me said, what are you wasting your time for? Are you stupid? Or what I was like, Article Clark being bored out, out of my head in an office, do anything to get away with that. But, and they all say, oh, it's, and then they have a number one hit. And you'd think they'd go away, these people. Oh, they're going to be a one hit wonder now. Oh, what are you wasting your time? Then the next record was a miss. Then after 12 hits, they decided to stop going on how stupid I was, you know. So that's, you're fighting against the world. Everybody will tell you you're an idiot. You're doing, you've got to believe in it. You've got to be able to take rejection. You've got to have talent and you've got to make the right choices. I mean, it's a bit like a football manager. If well, you well, buy the I, right player, okay. I apologize to interrupt, but how much of is it a gamble as well? Because I can imagine you're right. People probably said to you, Herman Hermans, they they probably they don't have the song, the voice for radio or the yeah. voice for uh, uh, music videos. But you took a gamble on it. You took a long shot and said, "I see something here," and you, I think this would be the next big thing in British music and in the music industry. How much of a how much of that sort of risk factor comes into play as a manager i think it's phenomenal risk phenomenal risk you, you know you, you've got to be really you know that when i say don't give up your day job most of the people that send me music that isn't extraordinary i say look really i don't think i don't think it'll get played or i don't think i, I can't do anything with it and I, you just got to be brutal yourself i don't know it's uh, it's very, managers, it's not an easy job to be a manager today at all. Um, I think you've got to be creative. If, if I go back to the, the Andrew Oldhams, the Brian Epstein's, the Colonel Parker was a genius, uh, much maligned, but he had some strange ideas and got around things that you wouldn't think, but because he had, he had his, he told me he had this concert on Elvis, in Charlotte and the forecast was for rain the next day and they sold I think 20 or 30,000 tickets and he spent all night trying to find an umbrella manufacturer <laughs> so he could sell the umbrellas at the game. I mean this is like you have to have that kind of craziness yes you call it gambling but everything's a gamble I mean if you go into a cake you start a cake shop still a gamble are people going to come in you don't know is the cake going to be any good yeah, I think life's a gamble. I'm a gambler, so it's difficult for me to say that. I mean, 
people think I'm mad, and probably I am, and that's cool. That's okay. I don't mind. I, the only difference to me and the other people is I know I'm mad. Whereas most people that are mad don't know they're mad, or egomaniacs, or whatever it is. I think I've got a better feel of the thing. Stories like yours are so inspiring because you, you, as I said, you manage some of the big names, but there's always that one story about the one artist that got away. The one artist, uh, artist that you always thought to yourself, why didn't I sign that artist? And I, I'm going to put you on the spot here because I want to know. That's the, that's the easy one. That's the <laughs> easiest of the lot. Well, there's exactly. two. Okay. There's so what two. are the two artists that came to you and you said, this, this is going nowhere. And then two years later, you went, oh, uh, screw oh, the boot. As that I one. say, Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice came to my office. They asked to see me. And they brought, brought me a dirt record for Herman's Hermits to do. And um, what was it called? Um, I Fancy You. I Fancy You, which I gave to Mickey Mouse and he rejected it before he'd heard the second bar on the record. Okay. And I said to them, well, I'll get it to Mickey Mouse. That's what happened there. I said, have you got anything else? Oh, yeah, we've got this album. We've just done a musical called Joseph and the Dreamco. I said, oh, yes. And, and uh, Tim Rice was playing Potiphar on it. I thought, well, that's okay. I quite like the idea of this. Think of all those evangelicals in America. Yes, we'll go for this. They'll all flock to see this, definitely. And uh, anyhow, I was rejected. I was probably about the fourth most powerful manager in the world, as far as record companies. If I phoned them, they, they took my call. It wasn't like I had to go through the fourth secretary and go out with a girlfriend. Um, so I, it was unbelievable. They just, no, no, nobody was interested. 10cc who weren't 10cc but were the members of 10cc what are you messing around with all that anyhow so i still didn't take any notice i put them on a management development contract for two years i paid them each five pounds five pound each a week just to keep the walls at bay and after two years and total rejection and total desolation we had a decision to make. Are we going to renew the contract and start another type of thing? And they said, well, we've got this thing. Oh, it's Jesus Christ Superstar. But, oh, my God. How can I promote Jesus Christ Superstar, Jewish boy from North Manchester? I mean, you know, the community would not approve. And I thought, oh, God, this is awful. However, I stayed very friendly with them. Tony Christie was Magaldi and Evita. Graham Goldman wrote a song with Tim Rice, his lyrics, later on. And to this day, I speak to Tim Rice, who's a lovely man, really nice. So that was that was one thing. And all I needed to have done was to get the publishing of um, of Joseph and the Dreamcoat. But I was too green. I was just new. And I saw Tim Rice at the Ivor Novello Awards. And uh, he says, I, I, I don't want to bother you, Harvey. Would you, would you like to know? <laughs> I just had a royalty check for Joseph. It was for a quarter or a half year for £395,000. And that was 30 years later. But my theory is, if I'd have done that, I'd be dead today. Because however excessive and however wild I was, if I'd have had that as well, I would, th I would have thought I was God. I would have just not, couldn't go wrong. So that was one. And the other one, I was friendly with Peter Grant, Led Zeppelin's manager. And Queen were looking for a manager. So I said to Peter, it's just obvious, we'll join forces, let's go and see them. And then meantime, I got some Wimbledon tickets to Roger Taylor, who's mounted on tennis, and did all the preambles and everything. Then we went to the meeting. Jim Beach, the accountant, and all the members of Queen, myself and Peter Grant. And we thought it was a done deal. We didn't think there was any doubt they're going to sign. The manager of Les Zeppelin, the manager of Herman Service 10 CC. Come on, it's obvious, but they didn't. Uh, my theory being that Peter Grant wanted them to, to sign on Swan Song, and I think that was a kind of spanner in the works. I think if we'd have just come for a minute, well, they, anyhow, they got the manager, they got John Reed, and they booted them out after two years. And Jim Beach has been the manager for 30 years ever since, <laughs> and he was the accountant at that meeting. Nice guy, by the way. And I loved Freddie Mercury. I thought he was bee's knees. I I can imagine the stories that you you told, tell. And I have two last questions before I, I wrap up with you. And this is my last question before my very last one. And I want to know, 
what do you want your legacy to be as a music manager in it, like you've written this book it's an incredible book i highly recommend everyone pick it up links will be in the show notes but what legacy do you want your like your people to look back on you as well i think somebody that helped develop um well from an english point of view helped in the british invasion because we were inundated with American music and Moon and June and Crooners till the, your ears were falling off and it was boring. And there was a bit of a, then we got a bit of a break with rock and roll, but it was still all American, 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 American. You couldn't get arrested. And then the Beatles came along and I was next with Herman's Hermits and we brought a freshness to everything. And my legacy would be two things. I think if you've got to believe in what you're doing, otherwise, you, you, it doesn't ring true, and you shouldn't be um, shouldn't be affected by other people. And I hope that the music that I'm involved with will be played forever. Hopefully, um, my biggest thrill was a, a, as a football match with my grandson, Manchester United's opening game, and uh, the fans, thirty thousand fans, started singing "I'm Into Something Good," which was fifty years after it had been written. And I thought, oh, that's great. And I said to my grandson, "You know, I'm responsible partly for that." And it was nice. The, the main thing about entertainment is if you can bring pleasure to people. And I always give the example of the Bee Gees, Saturday Night Fever. Could you imagine one and a half hours to like a hundred million people and they all came out happy? I mean, that's, if you just do that in your life, you, you have achieved something which is extraordinary. And I think I've, I've achieved it through the music indirectly, I hope. And I hope that'll be the legacy. So while we always talk about legacy, I always end on the question of what's next? What's next for Harvey? Is there another band? Is it just retirement now? What's next after well, writing really his autobiography? I've been working very hard on all the music that I've published from those days. And I'm also very interested in... Well, when I came to Palm Springs, for instance, I started putting concerts on here. We had there was a stadium and it was used for tennis, Indian Wells Stadium. And I became the agent for this stadium. And we put on the Eagles, the Who, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. You know, Heartbreakers, very small people, obviously. And we, we did it. And then because of political things, it, it, it evaporated. And the, the company, which was a 20 man thing committee, was impossible. I, I retired and the husband been a concert there since. So, you know, it's, um, what am I doing now? I'm just trying to do music, trying to do things. Uh, and the book's been very interesting because the book has re-energized my desire in a way to, to, to look at things. And I'm finding out things I never knew. Finally, I must tell you the story of Elvis Presley because we were in, we went to Hawaii at the end of a tour, Herman's Hermits, and I arrived at the hotel and a little telegram saying, the Colonel and Elvis would like to meet you. And apparently this, this kept getting changed, the meeting. And I couldn't understand when I saw the photographs why Keith Hartwood, Derek Lackenby and Carl Green weren't on these photographs. Well, apparently they got fed up of all the times they'd pushed it back and think, well, it'll never happen. And so it did happen. <laughs> so we met Presley. It was amazing. And that was just, just one of those things. Absolutely. That's amazing. Um, Harvey, I want to thank you so much. I just for found that out, by the way, bringing to make sense of that. I just found that out two weeks ago, speaking to Keith, when <laughs> I asked him, why aren't you there? And the same thing with Nebworth and Keith, Keith Richards. I've been interviewed, seeing about Keith Richards and how he felt about Nebworth, which I didn't know, and had all theories why what happened happened. And I know now. So I am doing more research, and I think I will do more when the book comes out, possibly later as a soft cover, and do more sort of things like Audible and things. I'm hoping to do a lot more on that. So that's going to occupy my time. That is amazing. And I'm looking forward to any addendums or part two of uh, I'm Into Something Good, uh, My Life Managing 10 CCs, Herman Hermits, and many more. Harvey, it's been a pleasure to sit down with you and talk to you. I don't want to keep you much longer because I know you're a busy man. So thank you so much for doing this. Okay, it's been fantastic to speak to you again soon. Now from, from Manchester, England, Peter Herman Moore.
Derek Rossendee, Paul Gill, Keith Hopwood, and Barry Shipman who are Herman Hermit. Mrs. Brown, you've got a lovely daughter. Oh, the shop is her awesome from where. But it's sad, she doesn't love me now. She's made it clear enough, it ain't no good to buy. Tell those things I won't tell Tell us she can keep them just the same Things have changed She doesn't love me now She's made it clear enough It ain't no good to buy Mrs. Brown, you've got a lovely hotel. 